beautiful. It's incredible. Yeah, it's very really, really lovely. Good morning. Yeah, my colleague, hey, how you doing? Good, yourself? Good. So you out in the beautiful? Yeah, I'm going to go up to uh, the park to go for a walk. Are you on your way to someplace nice? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm going to go to the Rockefeller State Park Preserve. Oh, nice. Do a walk through? Yeah. I mean, you know, do you the, do that often? Uh, fuck. Uh, no, I got to go get uh, Sorry. You have one? You have an extra? What that do? That'll do. I'm getting my mask. Okay. It's your cousin, though. Like, yeah. Oh, sorry. Anyway, so yeah, yeah, I'm going up there. So, I, by the way, Bernie, I sent you my comments on your form. Yes. Uh, about those last three policies. Yes. Uh, to make it easier. Okay. Um, and, you know, the, the only technical thing has to do with this case called Graham versus uh, Connor or O'Connor or something. This is the Supreme Court case where the Supreme Court limited police liability for, um, uh, you know, 1983, 42 U.S.C. 1983 Civil Rights Act violations uh, to only that which was objectively reasonable under the totality circumstances without the benefit of hindsight, a very, very generous standard. Um, and that, you know, that's the, the standard the Supreme Court set many years ago for civil liability for uh, police, you know, for police shootings, basically. And so my comment that I'm going to say to you in the committee is that I mean, that, that may be the, the current standard for uh, what civil liability is, but that doesn't have to be the standard for how police officers act. It can just be like, don't use unreasonable force. You know, you know, uh, it's different, like, what, you're, what you could be held liable for as to, than how you should act. Yes, I understand what you're saying. So that's... You know, that was my comment about that. I mean, it's, they have a, you know, generally correct application of what uh, is the standard for civil liability for violating the, the Federal Civil Rights Act. But uh, that's not necessarily the standard that, that we should strive for. That's all, you know, so that's the technical thing that I wanted to bring up. Yeah, I understand. Uh, so I, I, uh, I, I've, once a group gets on, so I'll be able to talk to them even further. But yeah. uh, uh, there's just, as you say, the standard that, that we have an expectation of in White Plains versus the standard that the, that the officers may be able to apply to based on whatever <laughs> civil liabilities they may be uh, a subject to. Or Yeah, and that's right. In other words, it's not bad to tell people what you know, what civil rights law is, you know, that you, you know, there's also a criminal statute, uh, which my cl one of my clients is serving a hundred months in prison for uh, applying excessive force to an inmate, uh, you know, for, you know, that, that process uh, under the criminal civil rights statute, uh, you know, which is, you know, uh, also, I mean, they, maybe they should be taught about you know, what the law is with regard to that, but that's, you know, different from what the policy of the city of White Plains should be as to, you know, what we, what we want our officers to, how they want, want them to think and act. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. And, and you just made the point of what they should be taught. Um, are you referring to our committee or are you referring to the police? No, I mean, the, the, what the police should be taught. In other words, you know, it's, not bad that the police are, are, are taught that this is the standard for, you know, that this, the, you or the city could be held liable or even prosecuted for violating a civil rights law. It's quite another thing to say, okay, the policy of the city of White Plains Police Department is, you know, don't use excessive force. Right. You know, you know, it's, you know, uh, you, yes, you're going to be judged in terms of your liability as to 
you know, whether it was objectively reasonable under all the circumstances without the benefit of hindsight, that's all great, but we still have a policy that you shouldn't do it, period. Right, right. You know, now, now don't, within don't the do policy, that. <laughs> within the policy that exists, as, as I'm waiting for everybody to come on so we don't kind of repeat it, but uh, there's, there's uh, what happens in the use of excessive force uh, that results in, in uh, uh, a death and then there's excessive force that doesn't result in a death. There's much more of that that happens that I have concern about than yeah. just that, that you know, uh, we, if, if we were to look at this as, as we look at the storms that come up, we have that 100-year storm issue. You still there? Yes, sir. Yeah, there's that 100-year storm that we look at that comes up and we prepare for. And then there's everything else that... that uh, 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 the, the rainwater and and uh, water runoff um, causes a havoc about, and we have more of those that happened in the hundred year storm. So uh, we need to also be very clear about that because I think that we tend to just think about uh, uh, the death and the murder that may take place from the uh, interaction or altercation with the police department, and I think that that's a, a not a good thing to just focus on. Well, uh, well, we need to focus on much more than that. Let's just say. Yeah. Hundred you know, percent. Yes. Yeah. And I think that there's value in even uh, to be honest with you, if this committee uh, was able to uh, uh, have conversation about what those, uh, what some of those types of issues are, what some of those into interactions have been uh, or what they could be, uh, I think it helps us understand where policy fits and doesn't. Just to look at policy based on what's on the paper, uh, it's all well and good, but not understanding how it actually affects the community or has affected the community is, uh, I think, um, uh, the wrong sight to have about how we're looking at policies. Now, where is everyone I, I got else? A, I, got, I got a message from Marie that... that uh, I'm here. Didn't... Oh, you got it. Okay. I'm here. I'm here. You guys can Oh, hear hi, me? Marie. How are you? Good morning. I have my video off because um, I'm still in my bathroom drinking coffee, but I am here. <laughs> okay. I am here. I, I turned my video off also. Uh, <laughs> I don't particularly... I, I, I Zoom so much that I get tired of it. I also edit Zoom and stuff, so... I get tired of, of it, but I could turn it on if you'd like. Nah, that's up to you. I don't, I know who you are. I can hear your voice. So no. uh, just to let you know, we're supposed to get an additional uh, member to our committee. And I don't know if this is or hasn't been done. At least that's what it was communicated to me by uh, Karen and Janet that uh, I don't know if either of you know, uh, Meryl, uh, Chavez or Chavet. She's uh, the president of the Haitian uh, uh, community resource at the Slater Center. Uh, and uh, I spoke to her uh, based on an email that I got from uh, Karen. Uh, but I don't know if, if uh, Janice and Karen had spoke to her directly about being a part of our committee. She's supposed to join us on Wednesday uh, at the uh, meeting with the police, but uh, I'm not sure as to uh, if uh, she's been informed that she is officially a part of this group or not. Do we know if uh, Pat is still with us? Um, and, and I'm gonna if Karen's on the line. Yes, Karen, I'm here. Hi, can you explain Pat's? Uh, I know you you had made some comments to me. Good morning, by the way. Hope that all is well with you and your family. Um, Good morning. Uh, could you explain, uh, you know, we keep reaching out to Pat and, and right. we don't get to see him. What What is the... So I did reach out to Patrick um, this past week and um, just sort of inquired, you know, um, if he was still planning to participate. And he had said that he was away last week. 
and that's why he had missed the last couple of committee meetings, but that he was back and that he was expecting to, you know, rejoin the group. So he's not on the call as of yet. I'm not sure if he's, if he's going to be joining, um, but, but, you know, he did get back to me right away to say, I'm sorry, I was away last week, but I'm back now and I'm, I'll be participating again. And then in terms of Merlene, I, I haven't reached out to her yet. I was going to do that today. Okay. I, I did speak to Merlene, oh, great. Uh, but I didn't give her an official, you, you're part of the group because that's something that yourself and Janice are supposed to do. Uh, so, but she is aware of the group. Um, and I did have her mark her calendar to attend our uh, meeting with the police on Wednesday. Terrific. So we're still waiting for Janice. Oh, no, Janice I've been is on. here. I've oh, you're here? I've oh. Been on. Yeah, Janice I, I, okay. on. When I came in, you and Richard were having a conversation. I must have missed the first part about it, but it sounded like it was an interesting conversation. Um, so Richard, would you please? <laughs> I mean, I, uh, heard, I guess I heard most of it, but um, I didn't hear how it started, so. Anyway. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, well, so I'll ask, oh, Richard, just a second before you, before you start, um, uh, because uh, oftentimes we we end the end our conversations with someone's running off. I just like to make a point of a, a, a question that was made about our attendance to the police uh, department on Wednesday uh, at in 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 the uh, around the issue of having an agenda. So uh, I, I just want to inform everyone that. We do have a, 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 a basic agenda for our meeting with them on Wednesday, and this is how it goes. It's pretty simple. Uh, we're going to have an introduction uh, from, uh, of ourselves to, to the uh, police officers who are going to be there in addition to a department overview, which may be about 10 to 15 minutes of time. I think that's going to be done by Captain Spencer. I'm not exactly sure, but I think uh, from our previous uh, 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 meeting, that's uh, what he had handled. And then we're going to have a presentation from two departments. Uh, and I thought that the two departments at this session, which were most important for us to have a presentation from, is one, operations, and two, uh, support services and administration. And that's going to be for about 20 to 30 minutes of presentation, maybe 10 uh, minutes from each department. And then uh, we'll follow that up with a question and answer session, uh, which is an open session that we'll be able to ask questions, uh, have uh, direct dialogue with those department heads uh, about their departments. And, and just to clarify what those departments are, uh, the operations departments, department covers uh, patrols, uh, prisoner processing and transportation and, and transport, uh, sector patrol, and neighborhood initiatives, in addition to uh, uh, special ops, which is emergency services and K-9. And the, uh, the other department that we're going to hear is the, is the uh, support services and administration. And, and they are responsible, or that department is responsible for data management, policy development, which is very important to us, uh, emergency management and preparedness and training. So those are the two departments that we're going to uh, receive information from and be able to uh, have our conversations about uh, this Wednesday. I'll, if you need, I'll send this out to everyone uh, through Karen so that uh, you'll be aware of the uh, topics of conversation for the day. Now that's it. Okay. Uh, and so Richard, uh, if you could uh, go back to uh, what you had originally uh, presented when we started talking earlier. Okay, so everybody should have, I sent some comments out on the form that you provided, Bernie. And uh, so I, there are three topics today. One is response to resistance, one is unbiased policing, and one is videotape recording of interrogations. So just to start on response to in, in uh, response to resistance, um, 
the policy calls for officers to uh, uh, abide by uh, a case called Graham from the Supreme Court from many years ago. And that is a case that limits the liability of police officers and therefore municipalities that hire them uh, to simply uh, those events which, which the officer's conduct was objectively unreasonable under the totality of circumstances uh, without the benefit of hindsight. And this is a very generous standard that the conservative that at that time Supreme Court of the United States uh, enacted or not enacted, but you know, sort of said what the standard was for civil liability under violations of uh, 42 USC 1983, which is the Civil Rights Act. So that's fine for what the standard for civil liability is, but that doesn't have to be the standard in, in my view for how police officers should act and how their judgments sh should, uh, should be judged to, for want of a better word. So, you know, my, my comment there was that uh, it's fine to tell people what the standard for civil liability is, but we want our police officers not to use excessive force, not to use unjustified deadly force, um, and that they, you know, they should just not do it. That should be the policy. Not that, oh yeah, well, it's okay as long as somebody objectively, reasonably thought uh, without the bed of hind hindsight, blah, blah, blah. Those are just weasel words in my opinion. So that's why I have those comments there. Okay. Well, if the policy becomes don't use excessive force, how does one define excessive? Well, I think it's defined in the, in the, in the policy, you know, it's using force, which is uh, beyond that, which is reasonably necessary. That's what it says, but then it goes on to qualify it by saying objectively unreasonable under the totality of the circumstances without the benefit of hindsight. That, that might be, I mean, that is apparently what the, what this, the civil liability is, but it's not, you know, you just say, you know, the poly, don't use excessive force. That is force, which is not necessary, you know, beyond that which is necessary. I mean, I think it's self-evident what that means. So Richard, what's your recommendation with that? That, you know, it's that we can, the, the police can tell the, you know, the policy can tell people what the standard for civil liability is, but that's not the same as what the policy of the city of White Plains should be. Our policy for the city of White Plains should be excessive force should not be used. That is only the level of force ne reasonably necessary under the circumstances should be employed. Because by using, by referencing this Graham case, it's sort of, you know, giving police officers this notion that, that they can be, you know, maybe uh, they're going to be justified, you know, in this sort of beneficial, whatever the cop thought was right at the time way. And I, I don't think that's right. I think we should be more, you know, at least the policy of the city of White Plains should be more strict in that. I, 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 I agree with you. Okay. So is this, again, or leaving too much discretion to the police officer as what he considers excessive? Uh, what you mean, what he considers acceptable, right? Not excessive. Um, am, am I correct, Janice, in what you're asking? Is that, that what, you're ask, what you're commenting on is his ability to say that he's making the judgment as to how he uses force. And... Uh, and, and how much of that force he uses, correct? Well, I was thinking as far as the police officer is concerned. Yes. And the way, yes. And the way it's written now, that it gives him, the police officer, um, too much discretion in what he considers to be excessive. And, Am I misunderstanding that? No, I agree with Janice. And, and, I, and I understand exactly what you're saying. Um, uh, I think that, um, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, Richard, Richard's making the, the 
and you we're all talking about the same thing and you're all right uh, i just want to be clear that uh richard's comment is based on there is a standing federal law uh that uh, that speaks to uh the uh, idea that the officer has this ability to make some judgment uh as to using excessive force but that that standard uh, should be superseded in White Plains by uh, our uh, our standard, which says that officers should not use excessive force. Is right. that correct? Yeah. Yes. Now and we just want we. It should be just clear. Is, you know, what I'm saying is, when you're teaching police officers what to do, mm -hmm. that you know we should separate how you. How you and the force might be find, you know, found liable for using excessive force from the general policy that don't do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just don't do it, period. Yeah, don't do it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I understand. I, I so, agree. Uh, so I, I just like the, the test case and the play devil's advocate. Is there ever a time when an officer should use excessive force? No. Hell no. If it's excessive, by definition, it's excessive. So a uh, police the, officer could be could be justified in using deadly physical force under a lot of different circumstances. You yeah, know, somebody so, is holding a hostage. You know, I don't have to. You know. Yes, and, uh, and so within the policy that that exists now, that policy does cover those types of issues. So we uh, and I think that if we're applying ourselves to the policy as we see it, that we need to be clear that. Uh, that we're not saying that we're ruling out the use of uh, physical force at any time. No, that's well, no. All we're saying is that police officers should not use excessive force. Exactly. You know, any time. Right. Now, we, I, in my understanding, is that we will know that there are going to be maybe a time or two where it might be necessary, but that should not be part of the policy. Because that gives them too much room. But how, if, uh, right. how, I mean, how do I, you how do you ensure that you have language that's covering? And we need to be clear about that because I think that if we're not clear, it leads to ambiguity in in terms of what we're saying. So we need to apply to as we're looking to or making comments about this policy where we're making those comments about. Right. Uh, right. So we're, we're not just saying that. At all times, a police should never use uh, uh, deadly force. And so we need to be clear about what we're saying as it applies to the policy as we make this comment about it. If that sounds pretty clear to me that you should not use it. Right. I think, I right. think maybe where the uh, issue comes in is maybe we should be, and, and maybe they have, because I didn't uh, read all this recently, but maybe the... the term excessive force should be uh, more strictly defined um, so that it actually says force beyond what a reasonable person would use in this particular situation or however you know it would uh, be defined um, because I agree there might be a little room uh, for interpretation if you just say don't yeah, use there, excessive force. There's a, there's a lot of room for interpretation as to to that and and uh, I, I'm saying that as a committee, because we are referring to this to to this particular policy, that we need to make comment about the policy where we see those issues come up. Um, so, uh, uh, what I think we need to do is to turn back and be clear about on that policy uh, exactly where we're what we're looking at and where we're making those comments to, which will better help us define what we mean by that. Uh, at any time, we don't want excessive force to be used. What is the difference between excessive force that's necessary and excessive force that's not necessary? If I have a situation where, and, and I've seen this happen, where, uh, for example, and, and I'll ask you this, this circumstance. I've seen circumstances where I have one individual uh, who may be uh, being put under arrest and is it excessive force where three or four officers look to 
uh, physically uh, handle that person to arrest them? Is that excessive force? Uh, again, it, it depends on the situation. They okay, say so, that the level they say that the level of force should meet the level of resistance. Exactly. So, I mean, if the person so so if I have one person who's resisting and have one officer, that's that's reasonable. But if I have one person and five officers, is that reasonable? Well, it depends on what those five officers are doing. If they're just standing there, I mean, they're not doing anything. So yeah, but if they're all trying to subdue that person, I've seen five officers climb on one individual. That's excessive. Right. But and, and, and I don't really I, I my whole thing is the level of force should meet the level of resistance. I don't exactly. know because I'm not I did not go to school for this. I don't know the right terminology or any of that, but I do believe that we it, it, it goes without say that there we know that there may come a time when excessive force is necessary. But if we put it down at in a policy then it gives them room to say, well, this was the time. So I don't know if my if I'm thinking clearly, but it just but, seems to me that it would be better to just say, we don't want excessive force. Well, excessive and, force and, is not necessary. Right. Reasonable and force he, is necessary. It says they have that. deadly force. Deadly force might be necessary. Correct. Excessive force is never necessary. Right, gotcha. and if you gotcha. if you look at this, gotcha. uh, if you look at the top of the page under response to resistance, the second paragraph does say the use of excessive force, and then in parentheses, illegal or unreasonable use of force. So right. what that's saying is that excessive force is never acceptable, like Richard says. Deadly force may be acceptable in some instances, but excessive means it's it's you know by definition more than what's needed in a particular situation. Okay, so so what you're saying, Marie, is that it's already covered in the policy that we see here. Well, I mean, yes, we could make it a, a little more um, specific. Okay, so that's what yeah. we need to do. What is that yeah. specificity that we want to include? Uh, and do we want to make that a comment? Or do we want to make that a recommendation for policy right. change? Well, so here, like, for instance, if you look under definitions, you have the uh, respiratory neck restraint. I mean, these it talks about chokeholds. Okay, so it doesn't really say um, that either of these things are uh, forbidden. You know, to me, it says that some sometimes those can be justified. I don't know if that's ever the case. And, and so what I'm pointing to is, are we making a recommendation here in this policy that we be specific about just that thing that you're talking about? Uh, I think it should be more specific and maybe, you know, flat out say that a chokehold is never, uh, you know, never justified, um, you know, unless an officer's life is immediately uh, endangered. Um, because it doesn't really, it's not really that specific. Is a chokehold banned in New York? I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. This says, I mean, this speaks to two different kinds, a vascular uh, neck restraint and a respiratory neck restraint. Yeah, a respiratory neck, and it's a different, where you're holding a different part of the body that you can cause someone to lose um, um, consciousness or, or the ability to breathe by holding different parts of the body. Right, right. Um, so I, I think that uh, this policy alone, I, we need to spend a little bit more time on just being clear about uh, what our recommendation is to it. We should start with what Richard has said. Uh, maybe if as we uh, go through this, uh, we should be a little bit more clear about it. Because I think that out of all of the policies that, we'll, that we have to deal with, uh, this is, this is uh, uh, one of the most crucial, at least in terms of how the community uh, senses this issue. Um, I know that there's several areas within this policy that I even have some uh, concern with. Um, and, and uh, for example, uh, uh, the duty to intervene by another officer um, and um, that which is, which exists on page if you have Two. a page. 
two, um, under uh, a section duty to intervene, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I feel is important that it that it, it goes through any any member of uh, present or observing another member using force that is clearly beyond that which is objectively reasonable under the circumstances shall when in a position to do so safely intercede to prevent the use of such excessive force. Members shall properly report these observations. And I think it's to, I think the chief or maybe the Office of Professional Standards, but I also think that this should be documented. And the reason behind that is uh, there needs to be accountability uh, of officers that may have these issues come up uh, more than once or within some time frame, so that we're able to actually track when we have, uh, we're taking into consideration uh, officers who may uh, um, routinely uh, perform uh, poorly behind this uh, in terms of interacting with people or, or going above and beyond in terms of uh, 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 using excessive force. So uh, that's something that doesn't happen now. And it's something I think that we need to make sure uh, through policy gets documented. And not only that it gets documented, but it, that it gets in some way followed up in some procedural way uh, and goes into their files and can be tracked in their files so that we can identify officers who are performing poorly in terms of their interaction uh, with civilians uh, and, and be able to bring some resolution to that. Maybe that's an officer that, that should be removed from a particular type of duty or removed from the force. Uh, but if we don't have, uh, you could have someone report this to a, a supervisor, but if it doesn't get documented, we may not be able to track that. True, true. Um, and I'll just, if we go back like up to the uh, preceding paragraph where it says prohibited force, I see <clears throat> the last one says, uh, the use of any respiratory neck restraint or vascular neck restraint is prohibited. That looks to me like it may have been added at a later date. Yes, Here. and, and I, I agree with you. Take note that this, this has been revised as of June of this year. Yeah. So uh, there may be some old language uh, tucked in here that, that uh, that they try to supersede with some additional language, as you're saying, but it's just a, a revision as, as we can see as it's marked on the, the date. Yeah. Well, that's what it looks like. <clears throat> uh, I mean, an, this yeah. whole, this whole, whatever you want, publication should really be updated and made a lot more uh, specific um, than it is. Well, uh, just as a, another point of information, uh, although I've given you the, the table of contents, I will ask uh, the chief uh, through Karen if we can have the uh, book of policies uh, and, and that maybe each of us need to have a book of that so we could look at it a little bit more in depth. Is that something that we'd want to have? It, 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 it could be useful. Okay. You know. So what, I'm sorry, what, what are you looking for? The, uh, when I, I, uh, the book of policies, there's a book of policies that exists. Yes. Uh, we have a table of contents. Right. And, and that's fine. It helps us uh, point to, but it would make sense if we had the book of policies. Yes, I can request that. Okay. Uh, and we'd like each of us, I think, need one in, in the, uh, within the group. Okay. So uh, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, got it. Okay. Um, I'll make that request. Thank you. Uh, there's another. There's another area here, uh, which <clears throat> called uh, uh, speaks to empty hand controls, um, where we talk about soft and hard techniques of uh, where, for where example, is that grabbing for... someone. <clears throat> where is that? Th that's on page. Page three under uh, a section, it's a uh, number C, no, empty that. hand controls. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
my concern here is that they have soft and hard techniques. Um, and the office, in the soft technique area, it says officers use grab holes, joint locks to resist and gain uh, compliance of an individual. Uh, and they also use uh, hard techniques. Officers use bodily force, punches, kicks to restrain and gain compliance of an individual. I have problems with that. Uh, because then uh, the, the use of either these uh, things are at the discretion of the officer, which means that uh, I could have an officer, and it has happened in the past, where an officer may either uh, punch or kick someone that they are in the process of trying to subdue or in the process of uh, trying to arrest. Uh, and, and this leads to uh, uh, bodily harm of the individual that they may uh, be uh, in the process of dealing with to the point of people could uh, and have been hospitalized over the use of this type of force that the officer has the discretion to use. Uh, and I don't exactly know how we rectify this within this policy, but it is something that I have seen and I know uh, <laughs> that uh, the community that I'm from and the community that I deal with have an issue with, whereas an officer has uh, the discretion of being able to physically manhandle or misuse their persons to the point of physical damage uh, uh, in, in the uh, pursuit of policing. Right. Uh, well, I would make a suggestion here is that um, this hard technique, uh, if that's what they call it, maybe spell it out by saying this is on only justified or justified only when there is an imminent danger uh, to a police officer of, you know, serious injury or um, serious bodily injury or death. Um, because of, it doesn't really say that. It just says, you know, it doesn't say anything about it. After that paragraph, it doesn't really address it again that I could see. Yes, I agree with you. It needs to be, there needs to be much more detail to it. I actually think that there needs to be a component of training behind uh, this part of the policy and uh, maybe within this part of the policy there needs to be some uh, comment made about training of officers or the continual training of officers as to how to confront uh, issues of uh, issues where they make judgments to use soft techniques or hard techniques uh, in the deployment of, of uh, using physical strength yeah, I, I, that just sounds to me almost bordering excessive, you know, punching and kicking does, it just sounds like it could be excessive. I mean, how and many, you're punches, right. it, how many it, punches, it is excessive. how many kicks, how many punches can you give, a, how many punches are they going to give you, how many kicks? Uh, I think that, um, and it how many just and, one and, punch. <laughs> and how many officers will be allowed to do that? I mean, like all three of them punching, all three of them kicking. And, and it just, it you're just absolutely does, right. It could you're be right, excessive. I don't like that. You're right, Janice. And that's why I'm pointing this out. You could have three officers looking to subdue an individual, and they make the determine and, and termination uh, individually as individual officers that they need to use excessive force uh, in this manner to be either to use uh, soft or hard tactics, either one of them could say, uh, I, I felt that I needed to deploy this hard tactic on this individual. A and then it becomes a, uh, a battering of that individual based on the individual officer making that determination. And so there right. needs to be some uh, some point made to this as to in our environment in White Plains that this is this is something that we want to uh, uh, make sure does not happen. Yeah, I well, think. Go, go ahead. ahead. Okay, I think that part of our recommendation would be to clarify that you know officers you 
that hard technique is very, um, it, it, it's just, it leaves too much room for right. someone to it's get excessive. seriously hurt. Because if all the officers feel the same way, then all of the officers could start punching and kicking. Right. And I yes. don't think that's, and that's, that to me just can be excessive. Now, if I, I don't see how that, that works, I don't know. That just seems right. like there should be another way to get a person to be taken into custody. I think violence by officers is never appropriate. I mean, I guess there would be times when it when it might be, but I think for the most part, officers shouldn't be violent. You know, I mean, I mean, well, unless it, unless it's really really necessary. I mean, people's lives are in danger or their right. lives are in danger. But you know, I mean, just to get someone in the car, you got to start kicking and punching yeah. them. Well, what's interesting is that this policy doesn't really make any um, differentiation between somebody who's armed or unarmed. I mean, yeah, it true, would make a true. big difference if a guy has a gun or if he doesn't, if he has nothing, he's just exactly. being unruly. So, good. you know, that's, very that's good. not even in there. That's a good point. And it also doesn't say, okay, sometimes they're already handcuffed. So, and and maybe now they're 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 not moving quick enough or whatever. It just seems like I've seen I've seen it. You know where cops are just kicking and and beating people that are already handcuffed. So it just gives them too much. I just have a problem with these officers being. And I know it's not the case for the White Plains officers for the most part. But I'm just saying we gotta we got to make it so that these cops don't have so much discretion. You know, it, it, things should not be like yeah. that. Punching and kicking is wrong. It's wrong. And, 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 and like Marie said, we, it doesn't mention whether the person has an, a knife or a gun or something in their hand, you know, isn't, there's got to be a less violent way for cops to get you in the car, especially, I mean, like, and it also should it should also be, be like, what was the, why is he being arrested in the first place? Is he being arrested because he had a counterfeit 20 or, right. you know, be, or because he uh, went into a store and started shooting people? Um, you know, I, I just, it just to me, it's like, right. no, right. I don't like it. it just I, I understand, I, I understand, Janice, your, your, um, anxiousness behind this. And I, and I have that same, level of anxiousness is just I have seen uh, situations where uh, a, a person who's being arrested can resist at such a level that it may require multiple officers to help subdue. I have also seen uh, situations where uh, someone who has been handcuffed can, phys can cause physical bodily harm to an officer looking to put that individual into a car because they're resisting being put into the car. That still does not justify uh, the hard techniques, in my opinion. Um, there are other, other methods that should be uh, deployed in order to uh, help the officer uh, proceed as they need to proceed. Uh, and that may be through tactical training. Yeah, uh, tra there might be however, some more training. Mm -hmm. Yes, however, yeah. Uh, that does happen where an individual does resist to the point that it could cause physical bodily harm, even if they're handcuffed to an officer. So uh, 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 the other point that we need to make here and be clear about is that when there are multiple officers involved in uh, uh, an interaction with an individual or a civilian, I don't know how we want to refer to that term, but uh, there needs to be some consideration made in policy to how those multiple officers interact with an individual that they may be uh, looking to uh, um, process in some way, if you understand what I mean. So just as you said, Janice, we may have an individual officer who says, well, I'm going to use my fist on this one. Another one says, uh, I'm going to use my... my, uh, my uh, nightstick because I feel that I'm in danger. So you got two or three officers making a determination all on their own separately as to how they interact with that individual in 
uh, pursuing an arrest of that individual. And they could, they could plummet that individual to submission. And we've seen that before, i.e. the Rodney King situation. So, Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so, so uh, there needs to be language that covers the, the use of force by multiple officers against okay. Uh, the one uh, individual, yes, or one. one individual, or even a group of individuals. Uh, but how how individual officers uh, may use this uh, technique of this hard technique in a fashion in which it may cause uh, bodily harm against one or multiple individuals that they may be looking to subdue. Uh, I just also, want to. Yeah. Can I just add one thing? Sure. Because I'm thinking of um, uh, of people that I've known. Um, I think a lot of times when this comes into play is when there is somebody who is clearly under the influence. Um, and I, I, I have a client, I had a client um, who was a PCP user and sometimes, and also a very big guy. He was, he weighed almost 300 pounds. So you know, in a situation like that, I mean, when, when a person, I mean, when he's not really um, trying to resist, it's just his physical and mental state. Uh, I think sometimes that's when the, when the cops go overboard. Um, because most of the time, uh, like this policy says, and, and I mean, it comes right out and say, most of the time, you know, people can be taken into custody um, peacefully if it's a, a nonviolent crime, pet, like Janice says, you know, a, a, a bad 20 or stealing, you know, something um, from CVS. Um, but a lot of times I think these individuals, you know, involve like mental health um, people, uh, people who have mental health issues and drug issues. And you know, there may be some additional uh, training that needs to come into play or maybe, um, you know, specialized officers. I really don't know how, you know, I know they do have some kind of um, procedures for dealing with the mentally ill, but I don't know exactly what they, uh, you know, what they try to do that's different. Uh, one of the departments that will be able to uh... Uh, speak with there is a department uh, that that um, is uh, operated within White Plains PD that deals specifically with mental illness and mental mental yeah. uh, um, mental health and I think it's also part of the the normal training within White Plains and we could ask those questions to be a little bit more clear um, but uh, I I would just also note that. There are many times in which there are individuals who uh, may not be under the influence of any type of drug that exhibit um, mental capacities uh, and, and a physical uh, capacity that may be harmful and threatening to the uh, officers as they interact with that individual. Uh, and, and that's something that we need to be aware of uh, in terms of reflecting on this policy, uh, because I think that it, it leads more so to Maria, as you're saying, an issue of training uh, and, and new techniques and new tactics as to how to uh, interact with people who may not be of the reasonable mind to uh, uh, interact with, which comes well, up right. but based they don't on really many different know what things. they're doing. They don't really intend, they're not intending to harm an officer they're just you know under the under whatever uh delusions yes, and, and, and various but, things but but being under that uh they can create tremendous harm to True. to uh to anyone True. And, and so therefore uh the officer may need to to use or multiple officers need to use uh, various ways to subdue that individual or to calm that individual and that's why I'm saying that uh, uh, maybe through training, new techniques and new uh, uh, avenues of processing through how do you deal with someone who is not of a reasonable mind to uh, 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 deal with. And someone who may be violent, not based on drugs, 
but based on mental capacity. Or yeah. they may be violent, not based on drugs, but based on the fact that they are fearful that something's going to happen to them. All right, as, as Jenna had said, we, uh, as African-Americans walking down the street, if, if we see an officer, uh, we immediately, our bodies go into, okay, I have to seize my, I have to stiffen up in a way or, or, or act in a particular way, uh, which causes us to change our general character as to how we would normally operate. Uh, and and I could tell you that this is historic. This is not just something that's just happened do, because of uh, George Floyd. Uh, it, it happened back with Emmett Till's time, or or even right. back before that. Uh, so uh, so the issue of mental capacity has a lot to do with how uh, an individual may respond to uh, an officer, whether they are uh, under drugs or not under drugs. Right. Um, yeah, but training, I think, also makes a, a big part of, of how uh, an officer is able to possibly recognize how they may be able to respond to that individual. Okay. So these are things that we could talk about on Wednesday, um, I'm thinking, with the office, you know, with the Absolutely. Uh, division heads or... Now, there's another area here that I had a question about. If you, uh, under D, intermediate weapon options? Yes. They have this uh, item here is this uh, specialized chemical agents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and, and they're talking about the issue of pepper spray. One of the things here that uh, needs to be even much more clear is that the uh, officers who are using uh, these types of uh, uh, devices must be trained and authorized as they are trained and authorized to use other items. Right. And it's not stated here. It does say may only be used by authorized yeah. personnel. Right. Whatever that means, so you got to be the, you got to be authorized to use it. They may be authorized to use it, but are they trained to use it? And, and that's <laughs> where I'm, I'm coming in to say that. Uh, it, so presumably, how, how, yes. Pre and you know. I don't want to presume anything in the policy. That's what I'm saying. That I, I would I would like for that to be more clear and, and more precise, as we're saying about other things. Well, again, this could go to training too. I mean, if, yes. if, they, if somebody has to be trained in, in using these things, like how exactly are they trained? Um, I mean, that it, this policy doesn't really say. No, and, and so, but we should, it should be, it should indicate in here that uh, there is some section that they have to follow that, or that is in conjunction with this, this section of the policy that said that they have to be trained because they do go through that in other areas. Okay. There's one other thing is that this policy, uh, even though it was written uh, in June or updated in June of 2020, does not make exception for uh, female officers. It keeps saying he. So what do you what what do you suggest? What said, you to uh, it should say uh, he or she or him or her uh, whenever they're they're referring to an officer because they're we have more than just uh, it's just a gender uh, yeah. note. That's a you know sometimes I think when 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 things are written like that he or she or they it can be distracting. That's my own personal opinion so to me reading this it just it flows more easily when it's you know just he or they um well, it, you i see a lot of police officers just the term oh yeah you're police. right so maybe it shouldn't say he or she it should say the officer yeah yeah well and you're saying that there are areas in here where it doesn't say that there is no place in here where it says it, there's a female, there's an in indication of a female officer. Well, but okay, what I'm for saying, instance, I'm... a police officer in the city of White Plains may use deadly force when he reasonably 
believes it's necessary to prevent or terminate the use of uh, whatever. You yeah. know, I, mean, I don't know that that's a, I mean, I would, I don't get, uh, you know, I'm it, not it, bothered by that. It, it's you know, not I, that. It's not that important. I'm just making note of that. It, it continues to do that throughout. It's it it, it 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 refers to them as police officers. Yes, but it does use he and him and himself versus. It's just a gender thing. It doesn't. We can move off of that. It's just I just pointed that out. It's a. Uh, so uh, on the. What page am I on now? I'm on to the fourth page. Fourth, yeah. And on the fourth page, there's an issue about reporting, uh, under reporting, which is, I uh, think, about mid-page or down towards, yep. almost going towards the end of the page. After physical force is used, the officer shall immediately evaluate the need for medical assistance and, if necessary, arrange for such attention. And I presume this is the officer seeking a, a physical uh, or, or medical attention for the officer. I'm not sure if that is for well, the individual. The yeah, no, I think it uh, would be not for the officer, but for yeah. the person who is the subject of the force. It's for the officer, not for the person who is the subject of the force, right? No, Correct? I think no, the other I way think around. I think it's for the person that the officer might have hurt. Yes, I agree. I believe, and I'm not sure, but yeah, I think this is for the um, the other person. Okay, yeah. so then then if 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 we're saying we believe, it is not clear. Yeah, but I'm and wondering. So it needs to be. These, I'm wondering if these policies, if the police officers themselves have their own policies, and that we have uh, the policies that are for the public. Like, is there I don't a, think so. No, you think they're combined? I think they're combined. Yeah. Okay. okay. I, I don't think so. Uh, okay. and, and we could ask that question of Winsby. I think that there's one set of policies, not one for the public and one for, because we had we just the, one of the policies that we received was a personnel uh, a complaint policy. That was a personnel complaint policy about police, not about. Uh, so I, I I do believe that they're all in one book, uh, but we could ask that question on Wednesday again. Uh, okay. So. I'm further uh, about that reporting. Um, arrange for such attention notification to immediate superior officer must be made without delay following the department uh, response to resistance report to the chief. Um, and this is where I at point would agree with Richard that uh, this type of information we need to make sure uh, is something that gets put into some uh, record retention mm -hmm. as to the officer's performance because it may lead to helping a community understand if this officer is a poor performer in that environment and then therefore uh, should be reassigned or removed or even fired from the department because they have continually gone through uh, 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 creating these situations where uh, they've had a situation uh, with the public that is unfavorable. Well, I agree. And I think that's yeah. where like a, a citizen complaint review board might come in too. Yes, but even barring the, the, the citizen review board coming in, this should be part of their uh, the review of the officer's performance. So there's I'm quite sure, at least I would believe, I, I believe that there is because of other activity that happens where training is an issue. For example, they have to qualify every so often for being able to use their weapon. And if they don't qualify, there's something that may happen to that officer where he, he, he may lose time on the job, he may lose something if he doesn't qualify uh, correctly in, in the use of that firearm. Uh, and there may be the same thing for other items and tools that they use or practices that they do. And so therefore, uh, we should take account when an officer has uh, uh, misused uh, their position uh, with civilians that it is accounted for within their, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure many of you have gone through performance review. So there's a performance review that they 
uh, um, should have to go through on a regular basis. And I think even every six months, there should be a performance review for an officer that's in the field. And that performance review should include this type of information so that we could have an understanding if this officer is poorly performing uh, on, on a regular basis. So we may not know that there's an officer who's out there uh, menacing the community, uh, even though they're in their role as police officers, supposedly providing uh, uh, a, a sense of uh, protection to the community, but they may be menacing uh, people in the community and, yeah. and harming them. Uh, this is a way to provide that accountability that uh, uh, that this when the situation comes up, that it is detailed and put into their HR report for their uh, professional review within the department. Okay. Can we go on to the um, to the uh, next uh, topic? Because I think it's, we're getting late here. Okay, I'd uh, just like to make a point that I think that out of all of the uh, uh, policies that we've covered so far, that this is, uh, I think, number one uh, we should have on, on our uh, radar for making sure that we cover as thoroughly as we can. Which is the next policy that you would like to move on to? Um, oh, the unbiased policing. Okay. I just uh, add something right now, though. Yes. Uh, in my comments that I sent you, I have an objection to the policy that permits deadly physical force when a police officer is affecting uh, the arrest of a person he reasonably believes has committed a felony in which the use or threatened imminent use of deadly physical force has been used by the suspect. You know, I believe officers should not be permitted to kill a suspect just because the officer thinks the suspect has committed a violent felony or a felony where someone threatened violence. I think that policy is totally wrong, and it's in there on page four under deadly physical force. Okay, and that's, that's under what we were just talking about, right, Richard? Under... Deadly physical force, yeah, under response to resistance. Yes, I, you, I, I don't see that. that. Also. It's on page three. Oh, yeah. I don't e, deadly physical oh. force. Okay, yes. Yeah, but I think it goes on to page four. It, it does. does go okay. on to page four. Right. A police officer may use deadly physical force in affecting the arrest of a person he reasonably believes has committed a felony in which the use or threatened imminent use of deadly physical force has been used by the suspect. Absolutely. I agree with that one. Absolutely. I, 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 I agree. You know what? We should not be um, considering people guilty before, you know, they've been proven guilty, you know, so. Well, to, but this, this is authorizing execution. Yeah. It's beyond, it's a, it's yeah. beyond guilt assuming. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. They're killing someone before they had, you know, it, this is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. Yeah. I think this is something that got to go. It's well, gotta right. go. Well, I think it needs to be further clarified uh, so that it brings justice to the to the uh, people that the police are providing service to. Um, and, and, and that we need to make sure gets rectified. When, uh, well, but as you say, Janice, what we can include is to make sure that as our comment, if you feel that you say, as you say, it needs to go, we need to give uh, uh, further clarification of why you feel it needs to go. Well, I think if I could just jump in, that the use of deadly force sh is only just should only be justified when someone's life is immediately threatened, not if, not just because somebody has committed a felony. So that would okay. have to be fine tuned. Yeah. and it says that somewhere yeah, else. And, and the so reason it has to yeah. be fine tuned is because. Uh, that's what happened to the gentleman uh, uh, who recently was killed uh, when he walked to his car uh, and the officer shot him in the back seven times, right? He, the officer did not see a gun. The officer assumed that his life was in danger, according to what the officer said. He made the judgment to then 
uh, dispense his weapon because he assumed based on his feelings that that person was going to harm him, harm him. And the grand jury turned around and, and felt that his, his assumptions based on his professionalism and his being a police officer were justified. So we need to be really clear about how we are referring to this and not just say, Janice, um, as you have used, that it's not right. We have to be clear as to why uh, we believe that this, the, the, the use of, of this well, statement the, in, in this policy is incorrect. Because it says that he reasonably believes has committed a felony. So and, and, be, reasonably and so, believing that someone has committed a felony should not warrant anyone the right to kill them. You're absolutely right. He, because he believed it, he committed a felony. I think right. a deadly force should only be in the moment. Exactly. He was, he, exactly. In the moment, not what he reasonably believed happened, but in the moment you he's doing something that right. could that's deadly or that he's hurting people in the moment, not right. something that he reasonably believed had done. If I'm making, I mean, no, that's you, that's, yeah, and that's, I mean, that's exactly um, what I was saying too about, you know, should only be used when there's an immediate uh, threat right. of in of, the moment of you know, danger. But, um, and I think it says that. So this, this, I mean, yeah, that's one of the areas that we could um, kind of press the, uh, uh, the division heads on and to remove that from, uh, you know, from the policies, even though it may be like legal uh, under, you know, um, constitutional standards, but it doesn't mean that it should happen. No. Mm -mm. Yeah. So I, that, I, so, yeah. We can say that a uh, number, you know, page four. Yes. Um, number two. Mm -hmm. Yes. Page four uh, under uh, use of physical deadly force. Um, I think it's proceeding from page three. Well, the legalese jargon will put down correctly, but yes. Uh, this is, uh, I, I, I just like to say, um, as I said, this policy that we're looking at, uh, uh, I, I, I know that we are short in time in terms of what we look to do be, and to move on, but this policy is so important I think that we should give it the time that it requires. And if we, <clears throat> if this is where we've gotten to today, I think that there's a lot of things within here that uh, we need to refer back to and put down in writing and then just attend to this. If we haven't completed going through the other two policies, well, I understand that, but this is so important, this policy, that we should give it the time that it requires. Okay, that's fine. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so yes, Richard, you had something to say? Uh, you know, I, I agree with you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, there's uh, the other items, unauthorized non-lethal weapons, uh, the carrying or use of an instrument as the office, as offensive or defensive weapon, not specially authorized or used as a weapon by police department is prohibited. Examples of unauthorized weapons include, but are not limited to the following, blackjacks, weighted gloves, stun guns, uh, and bare knuckles. Um, there may- Brass knuckles. Uh, yeah, brass knuckles, excuse me. Um, I, th there are other items that come into play uh, when there are non-lethal weapons involved also. Uh, uh, as of recent, I've seen uh, uh, where police are starting to use the things like their bikes in order to uh, 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 push, uh, secure, and maintain people in ways that uh, are not subscribed uh, as a weapon, but then become uh, something that's non-lethal that can be very um, harmful to a civilian. And I just think that uh, uh, in some way we should be able to identify 
uh, areas where, where things that are not normally looked at as being a non-weapon uh, actually get uh, uh, covered. So just not saying the, the ideas of blackjacks, weighted gloves, uh, stun guns, and brass knuckles, but other items that may be used as weapons. Yeah, Bernie, there's a definition in the penal law for dangerous instrument, which is anything which, from the way it is used, is intended to be used unlawfully against another person. Could be you hit somebody's head on the curb to kill them. Right, yes. Yes, and so uh, that that is exactly what I'm talking about, Richard. And so maybe we need to just make sure that that's reflected in here in that same way that, that it is in the penal law. Or, yeah, it's or penal that law, is to the penal law. Yeah, section 10, I think, zero, zero, but I don't know the subsection. So, Richard, could you, if you get a chance, could you look it up and include that in your comment? Sure. I appreciate that. I mean, it does say um, examples of unauthorized weapons include, but are not limited to, Right. the following um but you know i agree that it could be made more specific by uh, including uh the penal law definition of dangerous instruments yes that would help that would definitely help as as you've as you've presented it to us richard um and, and then the issue of reporting uh which comes right under that on that same page page four uh <sighs> After physical force is used, this is something that I pointed to before. The office shall immediately, and so this is exactly what I'd said before, that, uh, that uh, this information goes to the department uh, for response uh, to, res uh, to resistance report. Um, but uh, there in some way, we need to be able to account for uh, this reporting effort uh, that it not just be something that the uh, that the department chief gets, um, and this is as you say that the that that civilian review board would definitely have access to this information. Uh, but I think that this needs to be something that goes into record, uh, particularly pertaining to that officer. It's just reiterating. So what I, I guess had said we could before. say that it right put into an officer personnel file. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Agreed. So there's another issue here uh, that I'd like to ask uh, everyone about. So mm -hmm. I, I, there's the issue of physical force. And it, there's the issue of non-physical force. I, I happen to take that any commands or verbal uh, directives from a police officer can be threatening and harmful to an individual. And so therefore, I think that that should be accountable too. I don't know if it's within this policy that it needs to be accountable, but somewhere uh, there should be some identification of how uh, an officer may uh, interact with someone to the point where they have been threatening uh, and that that then in itself becomes a weapon. Uh, um, is there, are there any thought to, to that from, 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 from any of you? Well, if you look under definitions, okay, it says force is any non-negotiable use of police authority, which can include verbal commands. Um, so I guess that's, and, and also the mere presence of a police officer is included in this broad definition. Um, so it does kind of address it, but certainly it could be made a little more um, specific. Yeah, I think that that could use a, a, a paragraph all its own. Uh, um, I know, and I have, and uh, I've gone through this with other officers where uh, they've, spoken uh, 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 very negatively uh, and I've seen it happen to other people and I've seen it happen various places I'm and Marie I'm not sure if you or and uh, 
Richard have have clients who have gone through this, but those uh, uh, verbal commands, as you say, can be so harmful uh, that they may cause someone to have mental episodes, uh, having had dealt with them. Uh, uh, people can be uh, brought to the to the uh, point of being fearful of even being out in the street uh, or around or even seeing police officers based on some. Uh, verbal communication that came from that police officer. So uh, I think that that's something that uh, needs to be further uh, uh, identified within the policy as to how that is that is uh, uh, reviewed. And look, you, especially if it's an ongoing thing, like the yes, absolutely. harassment by a particular officer or so on. Are you are you saying like the way the police officer talks to an office uh, to an individual or what he says uh both i say that the way and what he says uh mm -hmm. so an officer could could threaten uh, an individual uh to comply uh and i don't think that that's just either uh, it, it uh, uh um i've seen situations where an officer has said something and caused a person to go into almost uh physical shock based on the fact that that officer had said something to to someone uh and that trauma has can stay with the person beyond the the time that they're in front of the officer so uh, uh yes I, I think that uh the weight of of verbal uh interaction from a police officer can in itself be a weapon Well, you know, I, I, I agree. They should be not able to be, they, they should always be courteous. That's just, they should always be courteous and uh, just know how to talk to people. I agree with that. Um, but I'm hoping that, and I don't know if this is true, that the cameras are going to eliminate a lot of that stuff. However, cameras in certain circumstances may not eliminate that. Uh, there are situations where the camera may not be on because as we've seen in the camera policy, the officer has the ability to, at their discretion, say that they're going to turn it off. I, I, hope, um, that we're gonna, I hope we're going to work on that policy and, where, and they I don't, so where, where, where they don't have that discretion. You know, and, I mean, I, and, I, and I hope so too. Uh, mm -hmm. But there also may be a situation where the camera stops working. Uh, well, for some not reason for all that, the officers. Not everybody well, not to all of, but there, there not may to be everybody on the scene. No, it, it may be only one officer out dealing with an individual, and that mm -hmm. still can cause for uh, some sense of uh, okay. So, give you an example. So, there have been cases where officers may stop a woman on the street and say something to that woman that that is so uh, 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 stirring that causes her to feel as though she uh, has been violated. Mm -hmm. And that happens. And mm -hmm. so being able to have it in policy that we understand that that is something that happens, I think uh, I would like to see is at least noted in policy that uh, verbal command can be used as a weapon in certain circumstances. Right. I don't right. know how we actually uh, 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 document that so that it is that it is noted but uh, in some way we have to make uh, note of that and maybe it just comes through comment but something we have to uh, uh, because I know that in in the black community it, it happens often where an officer could say something and really scare uh, where it's a Sunday and so I'm going to use the term please excuse me scare the shit out of people and so uh, I think that it is important for us to, to uh, take note of that and be able to, to uh, uh, make some comment about that. And also there probably, I mean, there may be a policy to this effect, I don't know, but certainly if you um, specify that any comments based upon somebody's race or gender um, obviously should never be tolerated. Um, yes. that might That might, go into like the unbiased policing. Um, yes. Yeah. 
but, you know, sexual orientation, that. you know, yeah, how about exactly. that? Exactly. Yes. yes. Exactly. Well, I think that goes along with gender these days, but, um, but you know, you get the idea. Um, yes. And that should be made, you know, a specific policy too. Because it could be threatening. I mean, yeah, maybe it's not the, the imminent use of, of, you know, physical force, but it can be um, it can be verbally threatening or mentally threatening. Um, yes. or who knows? Maybe you have a, a see the the same officer, uh, you know, a few days from now, and and you're afraid because you know you've you've heard what he's had to say. Yes, yes, uh, and and I yeah. would. I, I don't know that it is the case, but there have been uh, many comments uh, and, and theories made as to why Sandra Bland uh, wound up uh, uh, with, without uh, losing her life based on what might have been verbal abuse that led to mental anguish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what I'm pointing to. Um. I think that should take us here. I was going to say that should take us into unbiased policing. If we uh, if we want to talk about it, just really quickly. I don't know what you you know if you want to finish. I have the time. uh, If 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 everyone else has the time, um, let me know. Well, I have a little bit of time. I have to be in Yonkers by one. So okay, it's uh, two pages. So. Uh, let's let's look at it. Uh, who would like to uh, make comment first? I do have some comments down about it, but uh, who would like to cover first? All right. Well, I'll, oh, can you hear me? Oh, well. Yes. Okay. So I have on my comments list where it says under three definitions, it says based exclusively on a person's race, ethnicity, or, or national origin. It shouldn't be exclusively. I mean, why not just say based on somebody's, you know, race, ethnicity, national origin, sexual orientation or something like that? Why does it have to be exclusively? Because if it's motivated by somebody's race or something like that, that's wrong. It says exclusively. I mean, what's that? Where, are you, uh, where are you reading, uh, Richard? Uh, page one, three E, e. definitions. E. Racial profiling, the act oh, okay, of selecting okay, or targeting okay. a person for lawful enforcement, contact based exclusively on individuals' race, exclusively is where you say, okay, individuals' okay. uh, race, ethnicity, or national origin and not upon reasonable suspicion sufficient to justify law enforcement initiated action or contact. Okay. Yeah, to me, this is just, you know, telegraphing that as long as you say, well, it wasn't exclusively based on the person's right. sexual orientation. I knew I was looking for a gay guy, you know, or, or, you know, something. I stopped this person not just because they were black, but also because, uh, you know, some. I mean, it just there's no reason for weasel words like this. Okay. Gives the wrong message to police officers. And, and I agree with you. Uh, I kind of pointed to, there were a couple of things I pointed to in that same uh, paragraph under definitions, uh, section three, under page uh, one, uh, with, uh, on the first, in the first paragraph A, uh, where it uses the term individual demographics. And I'm, I'm not clear as to what a person's individual demographics may be. Yeah, yeah, I think this I is intended <laughs> intended to uh, cover for the person's race or you know, you know, uh, something like that. But we're, we're trying in, to we're, be broad. Yeah, and, and I think that in the policy we need to be as clear versus as broad as we need to be. And, I, right. and for me, that's not clear enough for me. Right. But obviously, you know, you have to make exceptions for identifying somebody. If somebody says, "Hey, I just saw," you know, a, a Hispanic woman or whatever coming out of the store with stolen goods. Obviously, you have to reference that um, if you. I think wanna... it is referenced. I think it is referenced. The talk in the you know. Uh, I think it says you're always allowed to you know for a description. I think it's in there. Okay. 
you're probably right. I just didn't. Uh, Richard. Send out. Richard, I don't understand. So can you help me understand um, um, definition E, racial profiling? That definition, can you help me understand what part of that you have a problem with? Because um, Yeah, it's, it, says, it's and it says that you cannot, under 3E, uh -huh. it says you cannot stop somebody ex because you exclusively focused on their, make it simple, race. So but, what I'm okay. saying is you can't mm -hmm. stop somebody based on their race. Okay, there has to be other factors. When you say exclusively, it's like saying, yeah, but if you, uh, you said that they looked funny, they were fidgeting, you know, they looked straight ahead, or they looked directly at me, or they didn't look directly at me, or they didn't look straight ahead. I mean, but is, is this a, a, a policy or a definition? It's a policy. It says you, you may not stop somebody exclusively based on their race. But what I'm saying is, the I, you know, it's, they it's, should, it's, should be clear that you shouldn't stop somebody based on their race. But I don't think that I'm reading this to say that that's what they're saying racial profiling is. Yeah, not they said exclusively. They, that, In other words, it can be racial profiling if you stop somebody based on their race. But if you say exclusively based on their race, that's giving officers cover to say, uh, well, I stopped but, him because he was black, but also no. because he looked at me or he didn't look at me or he fidgeted. I think I know what, I think I know what Janice is saying. Um, okay. You're right. It does say racial profiling. So I think these are the things that are um, not okay when it says racial profiling. Yeah. It's just a definition. It's not a policy per se. So it says, so that's a definition of uh, biased policing. And then if you go on, it does say that that's not uh, appropriate. And, it, and it, I, I understand it, what you're both saying. Uh, but I think that what Richard is pointing to is that the use of the word exclusively allows for allows wiggle room for this to be used uh, in support of an action that the officer does that is not favorable to the uh, civilian in the street. But Am it sounds correct? to me, it sounds, and I and I'm like I said, I'm not the one who has legal knowledge here. But it sounds to me like they're saying. The definition of racial profiling is this, not that they're saying this is what we want or what is allowed. That's right. Because, That's right. That, but it, what it's, it's saying is it's the, that what we don't who made want the, is when who they- Who decided the definition? Is that something that the police department made is the definition? Or is that uh, Webster's meaning of the, pro, of the definition? Well, whatever it is, it's in the policy that they've handed us, and therefore yeah. they've adopted this language. Right. Okay. I think it's but, their definition. It's their definition, but they're not saying that's what they want, right? Or that it's a. Are they saying that's illegal or not illegal? They're saying don't do, don't stop somebody exclusively on the basis of race. That's what they're saying is racial profiling, which is not permitted. Right. And all I'm saying is that that gives too much wiggle room to, well, it wasn't exclusively. Yes, I did stop that person because I thought they were a black person driving a Mercedes, but it was also based on what the hell is that black person driving a Mercedes for? I mean, I just don't think we should, you know, allow that kind okay. of wiggle room. Okay, maybe we shouldn't. No, you know, the word exclusively is the problem. Okay. That's, yeah, what that's, what that's, that's what he okay. said. That's what he said. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, within, within this section of definition, I do have question as to how we look at newer uh, environments as to where someone is judged. Uh, and we have these new categories of groups now, and these new categories of group happen through uh, issues of uh, uh, political affiliation and social media and online affiliations. Uh, somehow uh, the policy has to come up from uh, 2017 up to today where uh, someone could be judged on their affiliation based on their involvement in some uh, online uh, 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 group or uh, social media affiliation. I, I'm not exactly sure how that gets included, but it's something that, that uh, I would make a, rec make a recommendation 
that is commented on somehow. We have the issue of cultural group, political status, uh, social economic status. Uh, a, a new status is uh, social media affiliation uh, and online affiliations, which are tremendously affecting how we look and judge and and uh, interact with people. And believe believe you me, the police are using. Uh, online uh, uh, policing tactics in order to help them uh, do their jobs. You know, that's a tough one because that can be helpful sometimes in investigating uh, crimes. And, and I understand that. But for me, that's like saying if, if uh, I could be uh, uh, a member of a, an online group that I've never physically been in contact with in which you uh, may come to uh, 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 process some legal uh, um, activity against me as an officer. And because you know that I have this uh, connection to, uh, to this online group, you may make a a judgment yeah. against me in some way yeah. because of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I have to agree with Marie here that there, you know, the, if the police or, you know, law enforcement, state or federal law enforcement determines that some, they believe somebody is part of a gang, for example, or some other dangerous group, you know, uh, organized crime, then they can get a warrant for that person's uh, Facebook page. And that's perfectly legal. And it should be legal. I mean, it, suppose there was a QAnon conspiracy to murder the mayor of White Plains. We sure as hell want the police to get to be able to get a warrant for that guy's uh, Facebook feed. And I agree with that 100 percent. What I'm saying is that uh, because you have some pre-existing knowledge about my affiliation with this group, that you're not making some judgment based on that group's affiliation as to uh, me as an individual, as to what I'm doing. So that's where I'm coming from. Just as, uh, just as you make considerations about a cultural group, uh, that this is something else that you, that, that I could be uh, uh, judged under. Individual demographics that would fit under. Right. So I'm, I'm well, not saying that we, that we include the language in there, but in some way, I'd like to make comment to that because it's it's a new type of uh, uh, process. I can tell you that I've been involved with the police more recently where they get information about uh, an, an activity that's going to come up and they're talking to me about the the activity based on information about an individual that they got through social media. Uh, so the use of, of these new uh, uh, ways to uh, get individual demographics also affects how they may look and judge people. So that's just, it's, it's something that I think that, that uh, just needs to be made comment of. Well, I guess mere membership in a group, um, you know, obviously it's not a crime. It's no, when but assume, you know, the activities assume, are criminal. Yeah, but the but an assumed affiliation uh, as to who uh, you are based on in your demographics has always oh, been yeah. an issue for us. Yeah, but what if the group yes. is MS thirteen? I'm not saying that that they shouldn't. I'm saying that we need to make comment that it should be included because does MS thirteen get included in uh, social orientation? or religious well, or, or social economic status or age or disability or cult cultural group? Well, you just have to be careful how you phrase it because if somebody's associated with a criminal, with a, a, a gang or a criminal uh, group or a group that engages in criminal activity. And I agree with you. Yeah. I agree with you. I'm just making, I'm just making comment on there's a new group category that should be taken into consideration. And, and that's this, this, uh, the social media or online affiliations. That's all.
Okay, is there anything else on that page that we need to cover? Anything on the next page? Procedures. Fair and impartial treatment. Anything? Yeah, on page two. Yes. On page two, Bernie, where it says officers are encouraged to intervene under 4B compliance. Under 4B, just a second. Page two. 4B. Mm -hmm. um, um, there are two pages in this. I'm trying yeah, to find well, 4B. 4B. The second paragraph. Under compliance. Second paragraph on the second page. Under compliance. Okay. Yes. It says, where appropriate office shall be encouraged to intervene at the time of the biased police incident. It should be required. What do you mean encouraged? I agree with that one. Oh, what the hell is that? That's a good encouraged? One. You know, I encourage you not to have another second slice of pie. Oh, that's good. <laughs> required is definitely a better word. Okay. I think required. So um, just, just help me for a second. I'm looking at unbiased, po un un unbiased policy, correct? No. Yes, sir. It's un unbiased yes. policing is the policy 17-02 on page two under... Paragraph 4B, compliance. I have, uh, uh, oh, I see what you're saying. Excuse me. Yes. Under procedures, uh, B, compliance. Yes. And under B, compliance is number four? No, number one. Number one. Okay. Officers who witness shall report the incident to a supervisor. Also, where appropriate officers are encouraged to intervene right. at the time a biased poli policing incident occurs. Mm -hmm. And so what were you saying, Richard, just to follow up again for me again, repeat that? Not encouraged, required. Yes, I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. Right. I agree. Yeah. And and then again, down on uh, compliance number four, I have down the Office of Professional Standards shall maintain data. Um, this is one of those. This is one of those things where uh, I'd like this to be documented in the officer's uh, uh, professional uh, review, uh, because the Office of Professional Standards, as we I've come to recognize is internal affairs and internal affairs is like HR is there to protect uh, the, the corporation. Uh, so this type of information may not get out to a civilian review board uh, unless uh, it is duly stated as such. Okay, I'm down. Okay, uh, last one, training. Uh, it has all members will receive basic and periodic in-service training and where deemed necessary, re remediate, remedial training on subjects related to the following. And the one question I have down is conducting motor vehicle stops. I think that's police citizen interaction, right? Yes, absolutely. Conducting motor vehicle stops. You, you, what, what, do you, what's your issue with that one, Bernie? Well, my issue is that it is, uh, it is um, important that we understand uh, that this training, uh, that that it has to be documented that this training takes place. Not just that we're saying that 
uh, they're going to go through this where deemed necessary. It's not where deemed necessary. Um, we need to make sure that they go through a continual training over, uh, over this issue. This is think- where uh, uh, a lot of issues happen with African-American men that we go through these motor vehicle stops uh, and uh, the, the, the way that, that they take place have often wound up or uh, as being problematic for those that we've seen in the news. So uh, I don't want this remedial training to take place. I want it to be this periodic training in which it is documented that they've gone through this training just as they may go through handgun training. Well, it says all members will receive basic and periodic in-service training on these particular subjects and when deemed necessary, remedial training on the subjects. Yes, I'm just saying that we need to make sure that it's documented that this takes place. Okay. I I, I would hope that all training is documented. (laughs) I would oh, hope. I, 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 I'm, I'm not I of the hope. I, yeah, I we, want to. You, you want it in writing. I got yes. you. Mm-hmm. Right. So, is there so anything I else have to get we, moving. Yes, is there anything else that we'd I... like to add in terms of uh, this document? I think that we've gone through two of the policies out of the three that we were supposed to look at. Uh, I think that we did a great job today. Uh, we covered a lot of ground. Uh, we have a lot to put into our. Uh, table of, of reference. Uh, well, we could policies. always email each other. We could always e- e- email within the group if there's anything that we want to add or Absolutely. Ben- anything that we think of after the fact. So Absolutely. Um, now, now, as I understand it, yeah. as I understand the table may be put into a Google Doc. Uh, Karen, if you're still on the line, if you might want to uh, comment on that so that that we'll be able to uh, reference this in and out as we see each other putting stuff in. Uh, Karen? Yes, I'm here, Bernie. Um, so th- there are two versions of the document. The one that you originally created, which I think is much more specific to policies and procedures, and yes. then the more generic one that um, I created for the other subcommittees. So I can I can put one or I can put both of those into a Google Doc and share it with the committee members. But yes. I just um, but I don't want to confuse people. So um, I, I think maybe that your document is a little bit better for this subcommittee purposes. It's a okay. little bit you know because it 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 asks folks to specifically indicate which you know policy which section etc and i think that's important so i can okay. put that into a google doc tomorrow and um and send it around okay thank you okay sure so uh as we end up here uh we're all going to meet at the police precinct um i think that uh, i was asked a question about parking janice and I had to park on the street whenever I was going to police headquarters. I had to park on the street. There is Sears. You can park in Sears and walk across the street uh, to the to the uh, police headquarters, but uh, they don't have parking inside. I think that uh, will allow us to put our cars at. Right. The other there's no there's no uh, parking at the police or uh, public safety headquarters itself. But another parking option for you, this is the one that I use all the time when I need to go there, is the library. So if you if you enter the library lot, you know, if you're familiar with it, you go down like a little ramp, it curves around, and um, you have to kind of, it curves around to the left, and then you have to kind of make a right uh, to begin accessing the, the parking spots. If you make a once you do that, if you then make a left down one of the first or second aisles and head toward the back corner, you can park there and then you'll see there's a, a stairway, an exit that will bring you up along the side of the public safety building. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's the easiest and closest okay. parking. Okay, great. I don't know if that makes, hopefully that makes sense to people, but. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. 
All right, then. Um, uh, the day of, uh, I will just uh, reach out to everyone to make sure that uh, we're still in line to, to make it to the meeting, just in case uh, something comes up uh, business-wise that doesn't allow any individual to make it to our meeting. Uh, so we'll know ahead of time uh, that we're there. We're not waiting uh, for someone to show up. Uh, so I'll reach out uh, that morning. Uh, uh, Karen, are you going to join us? I'm going to try. Yes, that's okay. my intention. Mm -hmm. Very good. All righty. Uh, everyone, if there's anything else anyone would like to say, please uh, jump in. If not, uh, we're going to close our meeting for today. Okay. Thanks very much. All right. Have a good day. Great job, guys. Thank you. Have a good day. Have a good day.